and dad. <laughs> Well, a good name is more desirable than great riches. Have we heard that somewhere? A good name is to be esteemed, and it's better than gold and silver. Proverbs 22, verse 1 says that. And most of us probably knew that. So when you think about that, what does it mean to be esteemed? Well, Esteemed is a condition of being honored. I'll read to you what it says here. It says esteemed, condition of being honored or respected or well regarded. It is held in esteem, a man or woman who has earned high regard. As God started the recreation, he said, and we read this probably a thousand times, he said, let there be light. And there was light. And then he named it into existence. Maybe we never thought about that. I mean, we read it and we understood it, but he named it into existence. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate the waters you know, from above, uh, from water. And there was. And he called it, he called it sky, but you see, he called it. He named it. He said it was something else. And he called the ground dry land. From that land, God made man. He named man. He gave him a name. He called him Adam. And that means earth, or from the earth. And then God gave Adam the power to name everything else. Adam named the animals. Adam named Eve. That name means mother of all. You see a pattern here so far? Have we ever considered the various names that God has given his children? The names that he's called his people throughout time. The names that he's called his people now, today. Do you realize he calls us something else than Kevin or Debbie or, or whoever? When he named or renamed people all down through time, it had a meaning, and it meant something, and it does today. It still does. That name, or what he called them, it stood for something. It stood for what they were, or what they were to become, or possibly where they came from. You know, we saw Adam. He came from the ground, came from the earth. It stood for what they were going to do. How about what he calls us? Let's look a little closer to that. Among other things, he calls us his people. He calls us children of God. Well, that says what we will be doing. It says where we're going. He calls us sheep. He calls us brethren. He calls us little ones. All those have special meanings. The list goes on. There's always a meaning and there's always a purpose behind whatever name God gives someone or whatever he calls someone. There's always a purpose behind it. So I want to focus now a little closer. What about salt? Salt. Well, that's a little strange, isn't it? Well, when Christ gives us a name, one of them names were salt. We are the salt of the earth. He reminded us that in that, we have the opportunity, but we also have responsibility to influence the world. That's where this salt comes from. Let's take a look at this, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we'll read verses 13 through 16. <clears throat> Matthew 5 and verse 13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses fl uh, flavor, 
or savor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Remember that as we go through this. I want to continue on here, though, because he also says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a, bush, under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And I, I like that because that is a direct command to, when he says, let your light shine before men, he doesn't say, let your light shine before your brethren or your sheep, your fellow sheep, or the fellow little ones only, but it's before men. It's before everybody. We are to let our light shine before the world, and absolutely before each other, but before the world. And it's interesting that these verses, if you look at them where they come in the Bible here, in Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, they follow the Beatitudes. Now, in the Beatitudes, Jesus Christ, he gave a list here of the very qualities that each and every one of us ought to have that ought to be present in our life as we strive for the kingdom of God. Now, we don't have to turn there, but I've I, I listed them, so I'll just read these qualities to you uh, very quickly. And they're found here a little earlier in Matthew 5. Poor in spirit. That's a quality. Those who mourn. The meek. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The merciful the pure in heart, the peacemakers. And finally, he rounds it up with those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. These are all qualities that absolutely describe Jesus Christ. He fit every one of these you know, characteristics. And we are to have these characteristics in our life. They should be a part of our makeup. And it's a lot like what we said in the Bible study. You can't just decide one day I'm going to be a Christian and all of a sudden all these characteristics or qualities are in you, it's a process. It takes time. These are listed here and they're um, a guideline for us to follow, but it takes time. We need to work on each one of these individually in our life. And then we portray them. But all these qualities, they reflect the very character of Jesus Christ, which by default means they reflect the very character of God the Father. And because Jesus Christ and God the Father, through their spirit, lives in us, they should reflect in us too. They should be out there for, as we read here in verses uh, 16, um, it should shine, our light reflecting this should shine for the world to see, for all men to see. When we are filled with these characteristics, we will be an absolutely positive influence on the world around us. And at that point, it will make a difference. Now, you might not convince the world that this is the right way, but it will make a difference. It absolutely will make a difference. Now, if it doesn't make a difference today, a month, a year, 10 years down the road, they'll remember it. Something will happen in their life, and they'll think back. And, and maybe when they get into the kingdom, provided they are converted and all that works out, but nevertheless, if they live through and are into the, the millennium, they'll look back and say, you know, this group of people, they reflected these characteristics that I want to live in my life now. They reflected them back in the old world. It, it's a neat thing to have such a, a list that God provided for us as a guideline for our life. And the thing is, they're not unobtainable. They're not unobtainable. We can have these now. When we are living out these standards that Jesus Christ talks about, then, again, we will be a positive influence. And that has to be our goal, to be a positive influence on each other but on the world around us because you never know who will, will see and who will believe. You, you never know. We know all, you know, God has to do the calling and everything has to go through Jesus Christ, but he uses us. He uses us to 
plant that seed to reflect what that life can be like, even living in this world the way it is. Now, light, it's an eternal, or I'm sorry, it's an external quality. And what it does, it enables everyone to see, not just a select few. It enables everyone to see. So the Christian, you and I, the Christian who shines with this brilliance, they are reflecting Jesus Christ. And they are reflecting God the Father. And they will not be hidden from view in this world. And there's a lot of, like I said, opportunity and responsibility that comes with that. When we think about this, our example, it will, no matter what that example is, good or bad, it will emit out from us. And it will reflect the good things of God or the not so good things. But our example will show through no matter what. We want to make sure that our example is the right example, is the Christian, the godly example, the example of Jesus Christ. We want to affect those around us in a positive way. It's our calling. It's what God had called us to do. So today I want to zero in on the idea, again, not of light, but of us, why we are called the salt or the salt of the earth. In this one verse here in Matthew 5, verse 13 that we just read, Christ makes uh, several points. And there's three points that I want to take out of this. And um, I think we can look at these three points and get a better understanding of why we are the salt of the earth. Now, I'll just, be, uh, I'll just warn you right up front, point number one is very, very long. Point number two and three is very, very short. <laughs> so just bear with me. But uh, point number one, uh, we'll go ahead and start with that one. And it's simply this, a description to analyze. This is what we're taking from Matthew 5 and verse 13. A description to analyze. <clears throat> you know, people in general, they don't realize the importance of salt and how it maintains the life and the health of our bodies. Salt is very important. Now, there's extremes on both sides, but salt itself is very important. There's an exact percentage of salt that is supposed to be in the blood uh, stream. And if I got this right, it is 0.9%. I think that's pretty close. But that's, what's, that's how God created us. That was what it was supposed to be. And then any great deviation from that, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's exactly what God needed. It's exactly what he created. But any great deviation from this, it will result in sickness, and it could result in death. Now, salt is the sustainer of other life as well. And for this very reason, seawater, it will support many uh, organisms um, than fresh water, a lot more than fresh water. And a, uh, as a preservative, this salt, it slows down um, the, uh, the effect of spoilage. But when you think about that, it does that. It slows down rot, <laughs> if you will. But how good is it on a steak? Just the right amount. Sometimes it makes a difference of whether you're going to eat it or you're going to pitch it. So it, it's, a very, it's a very splendid condiment. This is salt, the same thing that we're going to describe here. And just think about all the descriptions we, we're going to look at here. You know, there's several places in scriptures that talk about salt and the uses of salt and its example. So I'd like to take a look at some of these with regard to this first point of a description to analyze. The first one is in Leviticus 2. Leviticus 2. Leviticus 2 and verse 13 because here we see salt as a symbol of a binding covenant. Maybe we never thought about salt that way before. Kind of a sub point here, a symbol of a binding covenant. Leviticus 2 and verse 13. <clears throat> it 
And every offering of your grain offering you shall uh, season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. Interesting. Salt must have some importance. Well, let's continue on and look at a couple other stuff points here. Go to 2 Kings chapter 2. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 2, and we'll read verses 20 and 21. Here we see salt being used as a healing and a cleansing agent, or a healing and cleansing aid. Second Kings 2, starting at verse 20. And he said, Bring me a bowl and put salt in it. So they brought him, uh, they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of water, and he cast in the salt there, and he said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death nor barrenness. Now, we didn't take time to read the story, but what you see here is, of course, this is speaking of a time in the city of Jericho where the land and the water, and it was contaminated. The land was barren. And they asked, the people here asked Elisha to handle the problem. And as we see here, through God, using salt, he handled the problem. He fixed it. Another one here is in, you don't have to turn there, let me just read this to you. It's Job 6, 6, and it simply states this. Can flavorless food be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? I gave this a subtitle, salt, it's a stimulant to our appetite. And it is. Look at Luke chapter 14. And this goes to what we talked about earlier, a preventative of decay. This is Luke 14, verses 34 and 35. <clears throat> Keep in mind as we go through all this, Christ said, we are the salt of the world. And we read all these uh, characteristics or uses for salt, Christ said, we are the salt of the world. This is Luke 14, verses 34 and 35. It said, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill? But men throw it out. He who has an ear, let him hear. It's important that we understand the analogies of what this is saying. And I, I think we'll, we'll have that as we go through here, so we'll keep on going. I want to just look at just a few more here. Um, look at Mark chapter 9. This is a promoter of peace. Wow, that's a, that seemed like a reach for salt, a promoter of peace. Mark chapter 9, verses 49 and 50. Mark chapter 9, verses 49. For everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have, uh, have salt in yourselves, and have peace with one another. So I, think we're, I, I hope we're starting to see um, a correlation here with this salt, because how many times have we read, if salt loses its flavor? That means... We can lose something. Well, let's keep going here. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, talking about Saul here. This is an evidence of grace. Colossians 4 and verse 6. Subpoint and evidence of grace. Actually, I'm going to go into verse 5. It says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. We start to see here, let your 
uh, speech, always be grace, uh, be with grace, seasoned with salt, knowing how we should approach people and situations, knowing, again, um, how we ought to answer, what we should say, how we, uh, the act that we should have. It's amazing the analogies that God has used in something as simple as salt. I mean, a lot of us take salt for granted. You know, we take it and we pour it out and we look at it and we, we kick it around. We, we may use it, we may not use it. Um, we may wash it down the drain. Salt is used for many, many um, operations and it changes a life, literally. So we are called salt for all these different reasons. And there's several more that we could look at. But I want to look a little closer now at a it kind of takes salt personally. How do we, and we'll put ourselves in here now, like I said, we, we're going to go personal. Look at how salt affects us in our Christian walk. And again, a couple of uh, a sub sub points, if you will. Um, the first one here is with regard to the salt and how it affects us individually, our preserving ability. Our preserving ability. You know, salt, we already said a couple times, it wards off rot and decay. And it does. It is rubbed into meat, and it's done for an effort to preserve this. If you've never seen this, I'm sure a lot of you have, it's a very interesting. Years ago when I went down to this, the island of Barbuda, I had the opportunity to go in one of their local stores, which was extremely rustic. <laughs> so much so that they kept nothing in refrigerators. And um, sure enough, on the shelf, there was uh, several stacks of big fillets of fish just laying there, flies running around, 98 degrees in there, and it was preserved with salt. No, I didn't buy it. <laughs> it did not look that appetizing. <laughs> um, but that's the point. Salt will preserve, no matter how um, rugged the conditions are, it preserves. And this goes to a personal point. We as salt, we are to keep preserving. What are we preserving? We're preserving God's word, God's way of life. We're promoting that. No matter how horrific the conditions are around us, when you think about salt and what it does, we are the salt of the world. We are to preserve God's righteousness. And it's a job. Now, we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and we won't turn there. It's in Genesis uh, chapter 19. But as you read down through the story, you see that they could have been saved. The cities could have been saved if they could have found enough preserving influence, if you will, of just ten righteous people. Ten. They couldn't do it. When God, when Jesus Christ, when the time comes and the return is here, will they find the preserving ability in us? It's a personal thing. You think about America today, and I'm very convinced that the presence and the prayer of a salty Christian, now I'll use that term a few times through this, a salty, you know, we always think, well, they're pretty salty. They're kind of rude. No, that's a negative connotation. We're going to do the positive. We are happy to be called salty Christians. That's the positive. Now keep that in mind. Because when I refer to it later, I don't want you to take a negative uh, tone to this. But it's the salty Christians, the ones who reflect the salt of the world. Those are the Christians who have stepped up and who have honored God and lived his way of life. And those are the ones who have promoted this nation to be where it is. Go back. Go all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Through their righteousness, through their faithfulness, God said, I will multiply and I will give you descendants and it, it'll be um, different countries worldwide. You will be, you will flourish. That's us here today. That's our descendants. We are descendants of them. 
And that's because God had promised those blessings to the ones who would keep His word. The salty Christians. Proverbs 14 and verse 34 tells us this. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation. Whenever a nation comes together and not just believes, but lives God's way of life, they're blessed. Again, you go back to uh, the descendants of Abraham. We are living proof that this scripture is true. Now, unfortunately, this country is turning its back on God, has turned its back on God for the most part. And when that happens, God will not stay where he's not wanted. God will not make anyone accept him. And because of that, we know that uh, you know, things will change and America will not be the, power, uh, the powerful co uh, uh, country that it is today. Things will change and it will have to have a downfall. And that's fine because God has told us this. We know about it. We're to watch, but we won't get into that right now. Let's look at another personal um, reflection of salt in our life. How about our penetrating ability? Our penetrating ability. That sounds a little different maybe, but you think about salt. Salt will penetrate and it will infiltrate whatever it touches. Have you thought about that? Whatever it touches. Salt, in its penetrating ability, is very aggressive. It's very aggressive. The early church, they did this. They acted as this type of salt. Let's take a look at this in Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, we'll start in verse 1. Acts 8, we're verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> now Saul was consented to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the uh, region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. <clears throat> and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. What sticks out, there's several things that stick out here, but the most important thing I think that sticks out here in the very fact that from a salt perspective, we are to be penetrating in God's word. We just read what Saul did. He killed people. He put them in prison. It says... He wreaked havoc on the church. Did that stop God's word? No. Because in verse 4 it says, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. They didn't quit teaching, no matter what, at all costs. God never said that come, be a Christian, live this way of life, and your life will be easy from here on out. He never once said that. Contrary to that, he said, it's tough. It's going to be hard. He said, people are going to kill you. People are going to put you in prison, in chains. They're going to torture you. They're going to do everything. But do it in my name. Live this life in my name, in God's name. He said, and you won't have to worry about the next life. It's a promise. Look at Acts here. Go down to chapter 17. Go a little further in the story. Acts chapter 17, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> Acts, 17, Acts 17, verse 6. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down came here also. Jason had harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. They knew what the, uh, the possibilities or consequences could be. 
I, I love this description. It says, these who have turned the world upside down. Are we turning the world upside down? Are we promoting our life for Christ, for God the Father? They did. They knew what the consequences were. They did it anyway. They were definitely following the example of penetrating salt. They didn't quit. I want to just use an analogy here, again, of salt and, and how it penetrates, you know. And I've already used steak once, and I like steak, so let's go back to steak. First of all, we have to understand that John uh, 4, verse 14, you have to turn there, but it tells us that Jesus Christ offers water, the water that satisfies to every one of us. So think about this. You have a steak, and it's good, but you pour salt all over it. And you can see the salt on that steak. When I mean, you see the little white cubes, very pretty. You know what it's going to taste like, and you're ready to eat it. But if you look really close, you'll notice there's voids. There's voids where the salt didn't get. That's us in our spiritual life. So you add, and I'm not telling you to go add, salt, add water to your steak, <laughs> but if you put just a drop of water on that steak, that salt melts. Now, the salt doesn't disappear. It comes together in a liquid form, and it covers the entire surface. And then it penetrates. And then there's no voids. That's exactly what this living water from Christ does to the Christian, to the would-be Christian. It enters. It covers all the voids, and it makes it whole. These people... They were called to promote the gospel and the coming kingdom of God. They did this at all cost. Is this any different than our calling? And we have to answer that. I would tell you, no, it's not. Absolutely is not. Our calling is the same. We are called to promote the gospel of the coming kingdom of God at all cost. It might not be pleasant, but it's the right thing to do. We have been called by God the Father to do this very same thing that we read about in Acts and uh, several places throughout the Bible. We read about it, we know it happened, and we know it will continue to happen. We are called to do this very same thing. Christ gave us a very encouraging statement, though, about the future church, the future of the church. So we don't have to worry. Let's look at this in Matthew 16, and verse 18. This is a, a memory scripture, Matthew 16 and verse 18. He was speaking to Peter here. Of course, he told Peter that he was the rock. Matthew 16 and verse 18 says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And then here's the encouraging part. It's encouraging to say he will build his church, but then he goes on to say, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In other words, no matter what Satan throws at the church all down through time, he will not win. His church is established, and it will continue up to and through his return. We can be guaranteed of that. Let's look at another sub-point. Again, personally, our purifying ability. Our purifying ability. You know, salt has a remarkable cleansing ability. And we already read 2 Kings 2, talking about Elisha and, uh, and the waters of Jericho. But an interesting fact, in the ancient times, newborn babies, they were washed in salt. And they did this to cleanse their bodies and to give them a firmness about their skin. I want to look at a scripture here that tells a time that this didn't happen. So, which shows the uh, default by that is this happened. It's in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16, verses 3 and 4. Starting in verse 3. And say, thus says the Lord to uh, Jerusalem, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite, 
and your mother was a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, which it normally was, nor were you washed in water uh, to cleanse you, which they normally were. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes, which was a standard practice. Have you ever, and I'm sure we have, gotten salt in a cut or a wound? It absolutely sets you on fire. Salt in a wound can cleanse the area. Now, again, it, it burns, but that, that's the effect of germs being killed, poison being removed from the body. This makes a good analogy for us as Christians. We have spiritual wounds, but as Christ said, we are the salt of the earth, then spiritual wounds, they will heal if we allow the cleansing agent of that salt that God said we were to take over and do its job. Often, uh, Christians, they have a purifying effect on the world around them. And I know that seems a little strange because a lot of times it doesn't seem like we make a big difference. But a lot of times, people in general, they will behave differently around somebody who is a Christian. We probably all noticed that. You walk up into a group and, and they know you're a Christian, they know you go to church on a regular basis, their conversation changes. You know, sometime one person in that group might look back and say, you know, that felt good. Why did that feel good? And then that just gets the ball rolling. And we don't know how that will work. God does. But the point is, it does make a difference. Being salt as a Christian, it's a purifying effect. And it does make a difference. You know, as we read earlier, meat offerings were made um, with salt, and that was in Leviticus 2. And it's the same with our lives. We are to offer our lives as a living sacrifice. And again, the very familiar scriptures, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are to be the living sacrifice. We don't do a whole lot of good if we give up and, and we go off somewhere and die. But by being a living sacrifice, by being the purifying salt, the penetrating salt, by being that, by being the salt of the world, we stand a chance to make a difference. Now ultimately, God has to do the work. But he uses us to make the difference. We make a difference. When we do, this proves that we are worth our salt. We've all heard that expression, somebody not worth their salt. So what are some other reasons God has called us salt? Well, how about our pleasing ability? We've talked about that already. You know, sometimes salt brings out the best taste in food, and it adds that flavor that maybe we were missing. In fact, there are some foods that are better off not eaten without salt. Some of us like salt a little too much, and we'd say about any food. <laughs> but salt does have its place at the dinner table. And it's the same as Christians. You know, Christians, we flavor the world around us. We flavor the world around us. As salt that we are, we are to live our lives so that we will bring out the best in others. And we do that, again, by what we talked about in the beginning, bear, the very reflection of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus Christ did time and time again. And this is what you and I are supposed to be doing in our life, today and tomorrow. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1. This talks about our conduct as a Christian, how we should be, what we should be doing. 
And it's really stated pretty simple. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Philippians 1 verse 27 says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Can we always say our conduct is worthy of that? We can't. We're still human. We make mistakes. But it's like we said earlier, you know, when we make a mistake, we acknowledge it. We repent of it, and we move on. Tomorrow's a new day. Now, we just talked about our pleasing ability, as sought here. How about our poisoning ability? Wow. Now, that's kind of the other side of things, our poisoning ability. You know, salt kills things. Salt can kill things. Have you ever poured salt on a slug or a snail, what happens? Well, it doesn't take very long, and that poor snail or slug dries up, and it's, it dies. Have you ever poured salt, a clump of salt, on a patch of grass? It kills it. It kills it. And here's the thing. It not only kills it, but it tarnishes the soil. So it, you almost have to remove the soil to get grass to grow back. Too much salt is not good for our blood pressure. I've heard that a lot, <laughs> but it's true. Too much salt is not good for our blood pressure. Salt used in the wrong way absolutely can and will be devastating. Remember, Christ said we are the salt of the earth. Salt used in the wrong way will be devastating. Notice what Abimelech did in, Jud in Judges 9. Judges 9 and verse 45. <clears throat> Judges 9 verse 45 says, So Abimelech fought against the city all that day, and he took the city and killed the people who were in it, and he demolished the city, and then he sowed it with salt. Why in the world would he do that? He sowed the city with salt. So he took the city, he killed everybody in it, and then he sowed it with salt. Well, he did this because he didn't want anybody else coming in and being able to rebuild the city and grow crops. By sowing it with salt, he tainted the soil. He killed the potential for growth. Think about that. A bad Christian, the salt of the world, can kill the possibility for growth in others if we misuse the salt. It's pretty, um, pretty shocking when we think about it that way. We can make an impact on the world around us by the very fact that our Christianity, if not used right, will poison others. We like to think that just because we are God's people, and just because we are trying to live the best we can, that there will not be an adverse effect. If we allow self-righteousness to come in to living right, that's an adverse effect. And that can go straight to the detriment of somebody else wanting to come into the church or wanting to be a part of God's church. When Jesus Christ truly comes, into a life of somebody and we all have experienced this the life that was there of excessive drinking or, or foul language or fighting or, or hating or killing or, or whatever it might be the list goes on and on when Jesus Christ comes into that that's put to death and that's put away but it has to grow notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. It 
It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we look at this old life of the, the fighting, the hating, the, the killing, the loose living, whatever it might be. When Christ comes in, all things are made new. That person doesn't exist anymore. Now, like we said before, you don't just wake up tomorrow and say, I'm a new Christian, I'm a 100% Christian, and I'm a perfect Christian. You might be a new Christian, you might be striving to be a 100% Christian, but we are not perfect. So we have to work at it, and it's a process, and it takes time. It takes a lifetime. However long God decides, that's the lifetime that it takes. So let's go on now to how about our promoting ability. As the salt of the earth, we have a promoting ability. Salt has a promoting ability. Salt creates a thirst. It creates a thirst for water or for any liquid. As salt, the Christian has this wonderful opportunity, each and every one of us do, does, to promote this thirst, this thirst that we all had and hopefully we still have, this thirst to be a part of what Jesus Christ is promoting here on earth. Remember what Christ told, uh, told us. He said that out of the hearts and the bellies would flow, out of our hearts and bellies, would flow rivers of living water. Now we know this same living water will come from the throne, the throne of God, that very same living water. Go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, and verse 37 and 38. <clears throat> John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38 says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, or his belly, different translation, will flow rivers of living water. This is the water that Jesus Christ gave us. This is the water that he said in John 4 verse 14 that would become a fountain in us, a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. You see, it's a, it's a, it's a building. This is the very same water that comes from God the Father. When we live as Christians should live, when we take our calling extremely serious as we should and we live right, absolutely the best we possibly can, without regret, we act right, we talk right, and we worship right, when we do all this, this is the promise that God has given us. This fountain of water will spring up in us to eternal life. Then we have the ability to create a thirst, a thirst for God the Father, a thirst for Jesus Christ in the hearts of those around us, the ones we meet, our friends outside the church. We have that ability, but only when we meet the other criteria. We can't be living a double life. We can't live a Christian life today on the Sabbath and not live it the other six days of the week. It doesn't work. But when we live it, we'll promote God and we'll promote Jesus Christ and we'll promote the kingdom. When that happens, we have the opportunity through Christ to point people to God and to share with them what we know and to share with them the drink from this water. What an absolutely marvelous opportunity that, ha that is for us. God has given us this opportunity. God does the calling. We understand that. But he uses people to create the interest. Too often we see some of God's very people. They choose to live a substandard life. They choose to live an immoral life. And the sad thing to that is the world sees it. You know, we might see it and we might pray for them, which we should, and we might tend to look away. 
The problem is the world sees it. And when the world sees it, this is what they say. Wow, I know that person. They claim to be a child of God. Okay, that's fine. Why should I join that religion? I mean, after all, I am already living a life as good or better than they're living. That's what happens. That is not promoting God. Unfortunately, the fact is, to some degree, they're right. <laughs> they're right, and that's not good. We have to make sure that we set our standard high and then live up to that standard. It doesn't do any good to set the standard high and then not live up to it. Our lives must be above reproach. That's what God tells us. If we are to create a thirst for God in the world around us, we have to make sure that we are living where our life is beyond reproach. And that's hard, especially in this world. We must never give anyone, inside or outside the church, cause to say, if that is a Christian, then I never want to be one. What a terrible thing to say. We don't want that. Let's look at one more point of point one here. Our proven ability. Our proven ability. Salt changes nearly everything it touches, no matter what. Food, ice, the list goes on. Whatever it touches, it changes. We are called to be thermostats and not thermometers, and there's a difference. If you don't know the difference, a thermostat takes control and changes things. A thermometer only reads what it sees. We're called to be the thermostats. When a genuine Christian touches this sinful, wicked world, there's going to be some change involved. Something's going to happen. We just need to make sure that we are the genuine Christian, and then when we touch this world because we have to live in it, then the world changes and not us. We can't allow the world to change us. And that's the other side of the coin. The modern mentality says that we must be like the world to win them over. But that's not what God says. God says we be like Jesus Christ, and that's how we win them over. And in time, that'll happen. It might not be today or tomorrow, but we keep doing it. We don't quit and we don't give up. We keep doing it, we'll win them over. Let's go on to point number two. Number one was a description of now, to now analyze, and number two is a danger to avoid. A danger to avoid. You know, salt was very, very valuable. Um, it was a commodity in the ancient world that they really sought after. It was so valuable, in fact, that the Roman legions, they were often paid their wages in salt. So uh, you think about that, it's amazing. This payment was called uh, salar salarium, I think, salarium, S-A-L-A-R-I-U-M. It's a Latin word, and it means salt money. That's what it means. It was a pension, a salary, and it's derived from sal or salt. And it was money paid at regular times for the work or the services of a lot of these uh, Roman legions. I think that's very interesting. Now we know where the expression, not your, not worth his salt, comes from. Makes sense. And we have heard that for you. I've heard that for years growing up. He's not worth his salt. Or he's worth his salt. Now we know where it comes from. It was possible for salt in that day to lose its flavor. The salt used was from different parts um, of the world, and it was a different kind of salt than we use today. You know, our salt today, the chemical compound is called uh, chloride of sodium or sodium chloride. That's the salt we use today. The salt used in the ancient world, it was either mined from the cliffs along the Dead Sea, or it, and that was a seven-mile stretch, or it was taken um, from the Dead Sea itself, and the water evaporated off and used that way. But it was a very pure salt. I want to give you just a little historical fact here. Today's salt water from the oceans, Atlantic, Pacific, all the oceans, it contains about 3.9% of the salt or the salt ingredient. You have any idea how much the Dead Sea contains? 
33.7%. 33.7%. It is so buoyant that you can float on it. It's amazing. Let's go back to uh, the harvesting here, saw it, you know. Um, when it was taken either from the, the cliffs or evaporated out of the water, either way, it was always mixed with minerals or vegetables and, or some type of vegetable matter. When this substance was exposed to the natural elements or when it touched the soil or the earth, it lost its flavor. It lost its worth. Keep thinking about how we are the salt of the world as we look at this. Even the surface salt that was dug from the cliffs, um, it was discarded because it was exposed to sunlight and the elements, and it was rendered tasteless. This tasteless salt also lost all the qualities that it had that made it its worth. We don't want to become the tasteless salt of the world. We don't want to lose our worth. This can happen when we, just like this salt in ancient times, when we come into too close contact with the world. When we say, that's not so bad what they're doing. Yeah, we can go there on a Friday night. Yeah, we can go there two hours before the Sabbath ends on a Saturday. We have to be very careful. Because a few little things look good, they look innocent enough, but it doesn't take long for God's salt of the world to lose its flavor. And when it does, we're going to see here in just a minute what its value is. This can happen very, very quickly. We have to be sure that we become more like Christ and dedicated to a purpose. Christ was dedicated to his purpose. You know, too often... We allow our wells, if you will, to be filled up with junk, whatever, just piled in there. And when we do that, it changes our life. Let's look at a quick scripture here. Back in Genesis chapter 26, Genesis 26, verse 15 through 18, and there's an event that happened here that talks about this. Genesis 6, or 26, starting in verse 15. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And they had filled them with earth. Fill them up, put dirt in them. That's the junk of the world. They put them in it. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there. And he pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. From the Philistines, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the name which his father had called them. When we allow the dirt, the junk of this world to come into our lives and overtake us, then we become useless. Here they had to dig new wells. Those were flourishing wells in the day. They used them. Abraham used them. They filled them up. They stopped them up. They became useless. When we allow our wells to be filled with the world's junk, then we become practically useless. And we cannot promote the kingdom of God, no matter how hard we try. We have to make sure that our wells stay clean, part of being the salt of the earth. Let's look at our final point, point three. Point one was a, descri a description to analyze. Point two is a danger to avoid. And point three is a destiny to abhor. A destiny to abhor. So I thought I'd look up to abhor. Get started with that. Here's what it said. To abhor, to regard with extreme repugnance or aversion, detest utterly, loathe. And it goes on. That's not very nice. This is a destiny to avoid, stay away from. In ancient times, when salt lost its savor, it was taken out and it was cast off into the footpaths. 
We've read that several times. It was used much as we use gravel today. Its only purpose then was to kill the weeds, <laughs> the weeds that might grow up in the road. And this was used for men and women and people to walk on, to keep their sandals out of the mud. That's what the salt became used for. Literally, it was to be trodden under the foot of men. We don't want to become that type of salt to where we become good for nothing but to be trodden under the foot of men. Christ warns us about this. Every one of us here today, we need to understand that when we lose our saltiness, remember the salty Christian, that's a positive thing. When we lose our saltiness as a Christian, <coughs> we cease to function as the salt of this world. And then we become stale. We become all this that, we, that Christ said to abhor, to stay away from. When this happens, we have to become, or we end up becoming something that's trodden underfoot. And that's not a good thing because there's not much way back once we reach that point. When we're living for God and we're putting Him first in our life in absolutely everything that we do, people may not like us. They may not appreciate us. But there's often, and we've probably seen this, a certain amount of respect that they have for us taking a stand in what we believe and doing what we know is right. And they see that. And they won't forget it. They might not appreciate it then, but they won't forget it. Now, I don't want to wind up being cast out as a vessel of God. And I know that none of us do. That is not something that we desire at all, or we wouldn't be here. I, like you, we want our life to be useful. We want our life to be purposeful and used directly by God in everything that we do. I would love to hear God come up and say to us that you have been faithful. All of us. That is our goal. I really would like to be a blessing and a light to the world. And I know all of us here would. I sincerely hope that's what we all want and that's our goal. But that's what we should strive for. And I believe that everyone here as a child of God, they want to be a salty Christian in a good way, of course. A salty Christian in a good way. In doing that, we will glorify God in everything that we do. And that's what we're here for, to glorify God. And if we seek to do that, all these points that we've talked about today, we'll make them happen in our life. Maybe a little bit at first, maybe a little bit more later on, and finally, they will be strong in our life. And this will keep us going through the downtrodden times that, that lie ahead. We always have to remember, though, that as long as we live in this world, there is a potential to fall. Paul recognized that. Let's look at one final scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. <clears throat> I mean, as much as we've talked about Paul, and we think the world of Paul, he was a strong Christian. He worried about the idea that he could fall as a Christian, not live up to the standards of God. First Corinthians 9, verse 27 says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. This is an eye-opener. If we've ever thought we were to the point where we couldn't do no wrong, <laughs> read what Paul says here. Paul was teaching and preaching and walking with others. And he comes right out and says, I worry that I will stumble and be disqualified. We don't want to take our calling for granted. We want to take it serious, and we want to treat it as the most valuable possession that we have, because it is. There's nothing more valuable 
in this world and the next than to have our calling and to live our calling. This potential here that Paul talked about, it's there for any one of us. Any one of us, as long as Satan is still roaming this earth. We have to understand that. So let's conclude then. As we consider our life today, can we honestly say that our life is that of assault to the world? And I hope we can, but then it goes into what degree. And that really, yes, it's important, but the thing is, make sure that it is there first. Make sure that we are the salt of the world. And then we develop a deeper degree of that salt. There's tremendous need for each and every one of us as children of God to be all, absolutely all, that God wants us to be. And we need it more in this day than we ever did. But brethren, we have seen enough falsehood and hypocrisy and weak living, to be quite honest with you, to do all of us a lifetime. We've seen it. We've lived through it. And there'll be more. But we need to be about our Father's business. That's the business of purifying. This is what salt does. Purifying, preserving, penetrating, pleasing, and promoting the very life that God has given us to live and the very job and duty that God has called us to do. We need to be about doing that. We need to set the example of a salty Christian. We need to be the salt of the world.